Good evening. In the run-up to the presidential polls in the United States, the two contenders, incumbent President Barack Obama and the challenger, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney, squared off in the third presidential debate, this one concentrating mainly on America's foreign policy. The two candidates sparred over various flashpoints around the world, arguing, arguing on America's role and leadership in West Asia, especially in Libya, Syria, Egypt, Israel and, of course, Iran. Debating on Afghanistan and Pakistan as well as the U.S. Uh, relationship with China, the aggression was visible on both sides, with Romney starting out the stronger. But President Barack Obama used his diplomatic credentials as well as his experience of the last four years well to rally and end the debate on a strong note. On the broader concept of U.S. foreign policy during the debate, both Obama and Romney agreed that the U.S. should not allow Iran to go nuclear. Both would support Israel in the case of an attack on that country, the 2014 withdrawal uh, timeline from Afghanistan and the need to take stronger action against China. However, the exchange jabs on the size of the U.S. military and the current situation in West Asia, Libya and Syria in particular. Surprisingly, India and the relationship that the U.S. shares with the country did not figure even once during the primetime foreign policy debate. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight on The Big Picture, we focus our energies on the third debate itself. The key takeaways for the rest of the world, especially the Arab world, and even though India wasn't really mentioned, we'll ask our panelists what the country should expect in case there is a change of guard in the White House and also what a second Obama presidency would mean for New Delhi. Joining me in the studio tonight uh, will be Anuradha Mitra Chunai, professor from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Mr. Ronan Sen, former ambassador to the United States. Uh, also joining us in just a bit will be Pramit Pal Chaudhary, foreign affairs editor of the Hindustan Times and Dr. Shashi Tharoor, uh, a former UN diplomat, currently a member of the Lok Sabha from Trivandrum. Uh, I'd like to start uh, my show today uh, from, uh, with you, uh, Ambassador Sen. First up, a comment on the debate itself. I don't know if you saw the whole debate. I did. But this was the third debate, centered one centered mainly on foreign policy. The foreign policy is supposed to be Obama's strong side, but it was surprising uh, to see that Romney was the one who was the aggressor in the, in the initial uh, bit, especially when he said, when he mentioned that point, that if he becomes president, he would show Putin not flexibility, but some backbone. I think that threw Obama off. Uh, is Obama losing out because he's acting too presidential during these debates and losing out on an all-out attack on Romney? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think they uh, both uh, uh, did pretty well. Uh, there was a fair amount of give and take uh, on both sides. But uh, overall, uh, if you notice, it's, uh, the focus came back to domestic issues. It kept it, coming back to domestic it issues. It kept coming back because this is what we don't realize, you know, and uh, this is what has been evident for quite some time, at least in, uh, to me it was evident at least for the last uh, three and a half, four decades, that you cannot have uh, foreign policy or national security policy, policy discussions outside the framework of domestic policy. These are inextricably linked. So you kept coming back to issues relating to the economy, relating to energy, relating to education, right, right. relating to you know, all the employment. So all these are linked on any issue. You, know, you take immigration, it has a foreign policy background. So all these are linked, and that's why I was, it was not at all surprising. People commented on that, but it was not at all surprising. Right. And uh, another aspect was, you know, I'll address it right on. You know, why not India? India is, but you didn't have any U.S. ally mentioned. There was Israel, of, of course. There was Israel, of course. No, but that apart had to from be Israel. Mentioned. Israel, you know, because you're talking of that region. And you're talking of a principal player. When you're talking about Iran, you can't avoid talking about Israel. Right, right. Uh, you know, because that country has vowed that it will be a Ambassador Sen, moving away from the debate, I'd like to get uh, uh, Professor Chinoy in right now. A number of flashpoints in America's leadership role, uh, wherever America is engaged all over the world, were discussed, particularly, most notably, West Asia, Syria, Libya, Iran, the whole, uh, the whole deal there. While both agreed that American intervention in Libya uh, was needed, it was Obama that pointed out that he and he alone went after Gaddafi and it was his decision alone and Romney hadn't supported that. Uh, there's a civil war in that country right now. It's a complete, it's a right mess uh, over there. Rebels are arming themselves and Romney wants to arm the rebels with heavier ammunition, heavier arms. Is uh, arming anyone who says that he's a freedom fighter the right way to go, the right tactic for America as Romney seems to think? 
Well, two things. First, generally about uh, the debate on, on foreign policy. Uh, the fact is that Obama has not just words on his sides, but deeds. Uh, the fact that he has had many foreign policy successes, like uh, the killing of uh, Osama bin Laden, have really shown that he is a strong president when it comes to action. Uh, the fact um, there was a blowback on uh, Libya when the uh, American ambassador uh, Stevens was uh, killed, and which was unfortunate, but it went to show that if you have what you thought was a, a neat war, an easy war, is not really like that, and there are hundreds of militias on the ground uh, today. Uh, similarly, though there were similarities on the withdrawal rate uh, in Afghanistan, there's also worry about what is going to happen over there, whether uh, the whole concept of Afghanistanization, the instability, uh, the fact that it may not be a victory but a stalemate, uh, there are a lot of open questions. So uh, I think on foreign policy, just as on the domestic, uh, Obama does have a slight edge, though, um, uh, and... Um, uh, Mitt Romney's uh, conservatism, uh, his excessive militarism uh, is going to actually uh, get him less votes because of the costs it entails at a time of severe economic crisis. So you're crisis. saying pandering to a conservative base in middle America could actually backfire for Romney. I want to get uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, who's just joined us on the program. Welcome to the big picture, Dr. Tharoor. Uh, uh, I don't know if you missed the first part of the program. My question to you, sir, uh, is of course about I the did. debate and West Asia was discussed at length in that debate. Uh, now, Assad, the President Assad and his alleged massacre of his own people, uh, his own population was another serious subject that was touched upon during the debate. By and large, the massacres have continued despite the U.S. warnings, but Assad doesn't seem to budge. How can any administration in the U.S., be it Republican or Democrat, ensure uh, that uh, the killings of innocent civilians stop? What is the right way to go about it? Nothing seems to be working right now. Well, as you are aware, the current American administration has, in fact, attempted to exert pressure on Syria through the United Nations Security Council. They have not had full support from the other members, and Russia and China have fairly actively opposed what they're trying to do. Uh, they have also suggested, for example, the prospect of a no-fly zone over Syria, as they had done against Libya a few months ago. But uh, the declaration of a no-fly zone often results in NATO aircraft coming in and bombing, and I'm not sure there's any stomach for that, even within the NATO countries, let alone uh, the other countries on the Council. So you're looking at the prospect, at best, of more sanctions against Assad, and even there, there is some resistance on the part of some permanent members of the Council. So I don't think that either an Obama administration or a putative Romney administration can do very much to change the situation. The purpose of these debates, essentially, is to show the country that they have the competence, the confidence, the spine to lead the United States in times of danger. That has always been the kind of purpose of a foreign policy debate. It really is not about specific issues of policy, nor is anything concrete going to be said in a debate that will actually be implemented. It is a perception game. It is about showing the American public, I am ready to be commander in chief. That's what the exercise is all about. And on that score, by all accounts, Obama did much better than Romney. Right. Uh, we'll discuss a couple of other issues that were discussed in the debate. Stay with us, Dr. Thurur. I'll come to Ronan Sen right now and ask him this. Uh, Egypt, another uh, very uh, big flashpoint right now. Uh, Romney seems to think that a Muslim Brotherhood president, uh, Morsi Mohammed, uh, being in power in Egypt right now is a threat to the United States security, national security, and otherwise as well. Uh, this despite the fact that Romney said in the same sentence a couple of minutes later uh, that the Arab Spring, which the Egyptian Revolution was a part of, uh, was he was all for that. He was praising it to high heaven. Uh, where do you see American policy gravitating uh, towards uh, in the case of Egypt, whether it's Romney or Obama? Well, I, I don't think it's going to be, uh, you know, I think from the debate when I watched that on this specific issue, uh, uh, it was not that clear cut because Obama said very clearly that uh, you know, he respects the outcome, and he didn't contest that. And neither did I think did Romney too much. No, no, he, 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 did, he, he did say he, that it's a threat to the US as a Muslim Brotherhood president is in power in Egypt. Right, no, but whatever he might say, you know, because he's, he's changed his position even during the debate, uh, even on Russia. What I'm saying is that, you see, if you, 
take the Muslim Brotherhood president. You know, the whole situation around Syria, we talked about Syria, it's very complicated. You look at the opposition forces. For instance, uh, Morsi is getting together with Turkey and virtually all the Arabs, with the exception of uh, maybe Lebanon and maybe uh, Bahrain, if there was a regular vote, popular support there. So it's not that simple. And what he, he, he did point out, uh, Obama did point out that it's not at all clear as to what the composition and the orientation of the opposition is. Mm. So they'd have to be careful. So he has been throughout urging caution. And Romney has been criticizing his lack of leadership, leading from behind and so on and so forth. Mm. So, but uh, as, you know, Mr. Tharoor pointed out, you know, these debates, and I've seen uh, a number of them, uh, they are really about looking presidential, looking that here your, your future is safe, in safe hands. Mm. Uh, a person who is uh, calm, uh, suave, uh, yet confident. Uh, in other words, the attributes of a commander-in-chief. Right. Uh, come, coming to you, Professor Chinoy, we all agree, of course, like the, Dr. Tharoor pointed out and Ambassador Sen pointed out, that these, these debates are for internal consumption mostly. Uh, they, are pan they, are, they are catering to their own internal uh, constituencies. Uh, but since our topic today is the takeaway from the debate, I want to mention the big one now, Iran. Uh, Iran, a lot of airtime was spent on Iran, of course, and that is, of course, very important for uh, the American public and any administration in the White House. Uh, the need to dissuade a nation like Iran uh, not to go nuclear, of course, is on the top of uh, Obama's mind, any other president who will occupy the White House. Recently, the NAM conference uh, was held in Tehran, and Iran, it was said, managed a sort of a coup, uh, where 40 leaders of the developed world showed up and, and attended that conference, including us, including India. We were there as well. Has Obama's policy of uh, crippling sanctions, like he put it, uh, at the same time trying to get Tehran to the table uh, worked at all? Is it going to work? Surely another front open uh, uh, against Iran would be disastrous for any administration. Two issues. One on the debate itself. And the fact is that uh, Romney's positions on whether it was Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood and on Iran uh, are based on Islamophobia. Uh, and uh, therefore, the minorities, the Hispanics, etc., are going to be polarized in favor of Obama, uh, the, and women also who do not want a war. So again, uh, that, that's one issue as far as the debate is concerned. As far as policy is concerned, uh, Obama's policy has been a fairly conservative policy on Iran, where he has tightened the sanctions, etc., but he has not got... Russia and China have continuously also tried to intervene and support Iran. India also has not really decreased the oil imports as the Americans wanted. So they know they have resistance. At the same time, I don't think they have the kind of leverage to have simultaneously four or five wars going on mm. uh, in, in West Asia and destabilize it to such an extent. We must also remember that on Iraq, for example, they know Iran has influence now. Iran has influence in Libya and Iran has influence in Afghanistan. So they would like to curb that and have Turkey as the major regional player. But at the same time, I don't think they can afford really to disturb the Arab street that much. By um, uh, the, And the sanctions are beginning to hurt mm. uh, Iran. There was a run on the, uh, on the Iranian currency and the president had to appeal that people don't dollarize the currency, etc. So there are signs and there are also signs that the Russians and the Chinese are arguing with the Iranians. So I think they need to get them all on board and right. they're offering that they would uh, do the uh, enriched uh, ura uranium so that they restrict themselves right. to uh, civilian nuclear uh, supplies. Uh, so there is pressure. Dr. Working. Tharoor, uh, your thoughts on Iran? Of course, Obama said that, uh, and like uh, Professor Chinoy mentioned, that the, the crippling sanctions, as he put it, are beginning to take effect uh, on Iran. Its economy is in a shambles right now, and they're suffering economically, at least. Romney wants tighter sanctions now. He agrees with those sanctions, but says if he comes to power, he'll make those sanctions tighter. Is this the right recipe for Iran, as far as uh, the White House is concerned? Well, the real issue in Iran right now is the question of heading off the possibility of war. The Israelis have been making very threatening noises. Some people are complacent saying that since Israel normally never announces in advance an intention to attack, the very fact that they're talking about it means they won't do it. But uh, uh, 
Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech to the UN General Assembly, which was as much aimed at an American television audience as it was at the General Assembly itself, uh, has certainly escalated the level of concern in the American public space. I don't think the U.S. wants to see Israel bombing Iranian nuclear reactors. I don't think the U.S. considers that that would actually solve anything. But it serves, through the intermediary of the Jewish American community in America, as a source of pressure on the administration to do more than they are doing right now in order to forestall a possible Israeli bombing attack. And that's why the talk of tighter sanctions. The U.S., as you know, has actually granted some waivers to some countries on the oil sanctions. Right now, India, Japan, Korea all benefit from waivers. We are continuing to buy Iranian oil. Uh, under Romney, the, in theory anyway, these waivers would not be granted and the sanctions would be more tight so Iran couldn't sell any oil and be able to, to, to profit from their own resources. Uh, that would be a worrying prospect, but again, a lot of things are said in the debates which may not actually happen when they have to really, really assume power and have to work in the real world. Right, Dr. Thiru, we'll take a small break right now. We'll come back and we'll discuss a couple of more points that were uh, a part of that debate. Of course, my guest seems to think and uh, continuously remind me, of course, that these debates are for internal com consumption only and not necessarily whatever is being said could be or would be implemented if any of those candidates become uh, the next president of the United States. We'll take a small break on the big picture right now. We'll come back with more. Don't go anywhere. Keep watching Rajya Sabha Television. Welcome back to the big picture. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, Ambassador Sen and Professor Chinoy are still with us. Uh, Ambassador Sen, uh, let me ask you this. Moving on to uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, AFPAC as they call it now. Mm -hmm. uh, 2014 is the deadline when uh, the US and allied troops leave Kabul and there'll be a reserve force about 20,000 that they leave behind. Uh, now, how real is the danger? Uh, and leave the debates aside for a bit. How real is the danger that Kabul will fall into chaos once again after the forces leave and as Romney correctly pointed out that there are over thousands and thousands of Pashtuns ready, itching to cross the border from uh, into Kabul from Pakistan. You think 2014 is enough time for the Afghan security forces to equip themselves to handle the Pashtun threat? Well, it's, that's no longer an issue right now. I think uh, the date is more or less decided. Uh, I'm not sure about the number because the number is not decided. Hmm. What's going to be the residual force which will remain there? It's quite clear that whatever the role of the residual force, uh, it will not have a combat role. So whether they are ready or not, the U.S. and other forces who are there, they are not going to, they're going to limit themselves. As of now, the indications are to counter terrorism and to training. And so I don't think that, you know, because America, there's, there's war weariness over there. And this has gone on for a long time. And neither of, uh, you know, different, you find some nuances, some differences. But on this, there is, I don't think there is any difference. Right. They'll, they will exit. It, some might go a little faster. Some might be a little bit uh, slower. It might be the pace, but I don't think that uh, data is going to change. Pakistan, uh, Professor Chinoy, Pakistan, the, disillusion, the disillusionment with Pakistan is clear on both sides, the Republican side and the Democrat side now. However, both uh, Romney and Obama agree that uh, Pakistan is very important and cannot be just left there, it can't be left to decay into a failed state, as, as one candidate called it. But what does any American president do when even the authorities in Pakistan are not being cooperative? Uh, they can't be trusted. The doctor who gave intelligence to Osama bin Laden is behind bars now. That's true. Uh, Pakistan, as uh, Madeleine Albright earlier had said, is an international migraine. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, uh, the fact is that uh, even uh, the Americans, uh, I don't think they have, uh, they've been giving it, Pakistan huge amounts of aid without sufficient amounts of accountability. And uh, for example, the Haqqani Network, which uh, uh, Mr. Mullen, their uh, commander, said was a veritable arm, uh, the Haqqani Network 
he said it was a veritable arm of the ISI, but nonetheless, they were only put on the terrorist list three weeks ago. So what, what, what were the Americans doing earlier? Mm. So the thing is that Americans also have been playing, uh, you know, with the, the uh, Pakistani agencies, and there's been a give and take, etc. And on the ground level, uh, there are lots of intrigues. Uh, but I think the push is that definitely, as far as both Afghanistan and Pakistan is concerned, uh, the, region, the region around needs to be uh, engaged not in geopolitics as the Pakistani army would like, but in some kind of uh, collaborative uh, security and uh, in, in ways in which Afghanistan can be rebuilt. Uh, it's, it's definitely not sure that it's possible, but that is the only possible solution. Uh, the fact that it can go into crisis is quite strong, but there can also be that the, um, you know, the good and bad Taliban can come together right. and become part of the structure of the right. government. Let's, let's get Dr. Tharoor's opinion on this. Uh, uh, Dr. Tharoor, uh, you, uh, you heard what Professor Chinoy had to say, of course. Collaborative security uh, was one word mentioned. Where do you see America's uh, foreign policy, regardless of what is being said in the debates, going on Pakistan? They have, they're having a very tough time in that country. Yeah, I think that there's certainly a level of fatigue and frustration with the entire AFPAC issue. Uh, on the other hand, they're rather deeply implicated and they've spent an awful lot of money in both places. Uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, I agree largely with Ambassador Sen. I think you're going to see a significant downscaling, uh, but not a full withdrawal. However, whether that downscaling will create conditions in which the Taliban can return to power and whether the imminent prospect of that might result in America trying to upscale again, that remains to be seen. Uh, certainly, a lot of um, promises to pull the troops back are always made before every election, and they're not necessarily fulfilled after the election. President Obama surprised everybody by pulling everyone out of Iraq after the last election where he promised it. But in Afghanistan, he's been careful to leave himself an out. As far as Pakistan is concerned, the issue with Pakistan remains that you can't trust them, that essentially uh, the Pakistanis to be taking money for anti-terrorist operations and spending some of it to support their own brand of terrorists, the Haqqanis in Afghanistan, and of course uh, the lashkar e toiba attacking us. Now, the Americans have become a bit tired of this and now much more public discussion uh, in the American op-ed columns, the American press, about uh, the Pakistani perfidy and so on. And the level of patience with Pakistan has dipped precipitously since the, the heyday when they were giving large amounts of money. And with the killing of Osama bin Laden, both the level of mistrust has gone up and the American incentive to support Pakistan has gone down. So if I were Pakistani, I would be pretty worried about the long-term future of American support uh, for, for Pakistan. I think it's, it's definitely not something they can count upon under whichever candidate becoming president. Right. Uh, Dr. Thurur, I want to talk about China now. I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Thurur. China is beyond doubt the biggest worry that America faces right now on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the trade deficit with China, all the jobs going there, the debt, that keeps adding. That keeps adding to the anxiety over China inside America. Romney mentioned that uh, uh, China keeps its currency uh, intentionally down so that uh, their uh, products cost lower, uh, keep the, the product cost keeps going lower. And he said he would also pressurize China uh, to stop devaluing their currency so much. How feasible is that really going to be? China is no pushover. Well, actually, the Americans have been pressurizing China for quite some time uh, to revalue the renminbi. And in fact, it has gone up roughly about uh, 15 to 20 percent in the last four or five years through a very carefully managed rise. The Chinese have had to give in to some degree to these pressures. I don't know if Romney's uh, rhetoric is going to change the, the level of cooperation the Chinese have given on this matter because the Chinese have a very realistic sense 
of what their economy can sustain, and they won't let it rise in value beyond a certain point. Right. Having said that, the Chinese um, uh, do control two or three trillion dollars of American treasury bonds. And so one thing one must recognize is that the Americans and the Chinese are very deeply implicated in each other's economies. Uh, the Chinese have invested a lot of their surplus in America, and a lot of Amer China's prosperity is a result of American investment in China. Uh, American private sector companies are the engines for China's economic growth. That's the one thing that makes me feel that despite some of the Cold War type rhetoric, it's not going to be a US-Soviet kind of relationship ever. Because whereas the US and the Soviet Union had no interpenetration economically or in terms of popular people-to-people -people contact and travel and so on, between America and China, there's much, much more connection. There's economic cooperation, the American investment in China, the Chinese savings in America, tourists going in both directions, right. educational exchanges, cultural exchanges, American professors right. teaching in Chinese universities, Chinese students studying in America, and so on. So I think that we're going to see a, a, a fairly manageable relationship, right. uh, whatever the outcome right. of the Coming to Master Sen now, uh, sir, uh, we are running out of time, but I want to get each one of you's opinion uh, on... What does India really take away from the debates? And like you mentioned, the debates are for internal consumption. But still, indeed, do you see any? Uh, do you foresee any major changes uh, in the policy towards India after the November presidential polls are over? And is another Obama term really going to help uh, benefit India more than the other way around, more than in the Romney administration? Well, I don't think there's going to be any substantive change at all, because uh, there, there's always, you know, some. Uh, period of uh, where people get adjusted to their uh, their own positions, their stated positions. On China, you have had successive presidents starting off with a very tough position, right from Clinton to, from, you know, the butchers of Beijing to, you know, an accommodation, almost a G2 type of accommodation. Uh, Obama starting off in a particular way, corrected very, uh, I mean, early in his uh, presidency. But nonetheless, uh, you know, there is an equilibrium which is reached because, as uh, Mr. Tharoor pointed out, you know, in a sense, they joined at the hip. Now, but today, I would say that the biggest, you know, for us, the issues are not going to be directly affecting us. There's a great deal of goodwill and bipartisan support on both sides of the aisle and among people in general for this relationship. What is going to happen is how are we going to react to, let's say, a very sharp escalation of tensions, if right. not conflict in Iran. So how are we going to, you know, for some of the complaints against China, they can apply on, on the trade side, we can be the collateral damage. Right, right. So yes. those are the aspects, but those are going to be in nuances. There's going to be no direct implication. Absolutely. Uh, I must get Professor Chinoy for the last word. We have very little time, but briefly, India's, what should India take away? Well, uh, I think uh, I agree that uh, there's not going to be any very serious impact either way on India. The relationships will grow precisely because uh, the, the relationship with China is complex. They want to engage with them economically but contain them militarily, but India should not fall into that. But they need India more than India needs them. They need the Indian markets for their economy. They, need, uh, they want to enter into the Indian military, defense, uh, ex import, right. export, etc. So the relationship with India will grow, but India has to make sure that they, their own interests are also safeguarded. Always because they're going to of. lean on India on all these issues. Absolutely. We, we are completely out of time. I must thank all my guests uh, for joining me on the show. Dr. Shashi Tharoor, thank you so much for joining us on The Big Picture. Ambassador Ron Insane and Professor Anurad Chinoy. Uh, of course, uh, like all my guests perhaps said, that these debates are for only internal consumption. Doesn't really matter what they say in the debate. All they have to do is look presidential. But yes, some important points, especially in West Asia, Syria, Libya, as well as the AFPAC uh, uh, a, a region of the world, uh, no major change, uh, my guest oversee towards India. And that's all we have uh, on the big picture tonight. Uh, Athar Khan saying goodbye, good night, and thank you for watching.